On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at unity in the church. Every believer in Christ should long for the day that we are one again, that there is visible unity in the church. This is something that should be close to the heart of every believer in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Pope John Paul II, he said it's a sin not to work towards unity. I like this promise about giving a cup of water to someone. You give a cup of water to someone, you won't lose your reward. It says, it's interesting, a lot of times we look at this promise, you know, to give a cup of water to someone, and we think of the poor, you know, poor people who don't have enough to eat and drink. And certainly, this is part of what Jesus is talking about. But when we look at the passage carefully, it says, anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Now again, all of God's people, all of the children of God, all of humanity belongs to Christ. But again, in, in this passage, Jesus is he's speaking specifically about people who are doing the work of God. Immediately preceding, the, there's the story of uh, the disciples saying, hey, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him. And Jesus, said, Jesus says, um, do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. And so again, uh, this cup of water is in reference to someone who's doing the work of God. It makes me think of uh, those of you who are at the ministry retreat. Jim Murphy shared a bit of his story about walking across America with a cross. And um, there was times, because he didn't bring any money or a wallet or anything, there was times where he didn't have food. And there was even times where he didn't even have anything to drink. He was kind of looking forward to the next place he could get water. And I'm just imagining, like, he was doing the work of God. He was evangelizing and doing wonderful things. Like, how nice it would have been to drive by and to see him and say, hey, can I give you a bottle of water? I mean, there's a, there's a direct response or, you know, responding to Jesus' uh, call to give a w cup of water to someone who's doing uh, his work. And then it goes on, similarly... It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. Now again, oftentimes when we read this passage, we think about children, people who cause children to sin. And certainly that's part of it. But again, if we look at what Jesus is specifically saying, the little ones he's talking about, again, are the people who are doing the work of God. Or here specifically, um, little ones who believe in me. And again, one of the examples I think of for this is um, our young people when they go off to college or university. I hear so many stories, you know, sometimes parents saying, my, you know, my son, my daughter, she was such a good, you know, Catholic and all that, but as soon as she went to college, she lost her faith. And when I was a chaplain at, uh, at York University up in Toronto, I saw that. I saw good Catholic students who had a fairly firm faith, and they would go and they'd, they'd take some of, some of these courses, and some of the professors were very anti-Christian, and just confusing the students and all of that type of thing. And the flip side was there were a few professors who were actually good Christians, and they would they would, uh, you know, speak the truth and encourage these, these students and all that. But again, we, we, you look at the consequence. Jesus says it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And this is kind of a, a sign of the Lord's passionate love for those who believe in him. I mean, he loves everybody, but, you know, people who have a love for Christ, he does not want to see us um, rob these people you know, of, of, of their faith. Now, one of the scandals, speaking of what causes our young people and even not so young people to lose their faith, one of the uh, scandals is the scandal of the disunity among Christians. How many young people, they want to walk as a Christian, they want to follow the Lord Jesus, and then they get caught in the middle of the bickering and arguing and, and you know, disagreements between different Christians. And a lot of them, they get confused, they get frustrated, and they say, you know what, forget it. 
I'm confused, I don't know what's right and wrong, and they just drop their faith. The disunity among Christians is a scandal. It's an anti-witness, and that's why the, the call to unity is so important. Now what I want to do tonight is I want to share with you seven, um, seven p- important points about Christian unity. Seven points about Christian unity. And, and the reason we're speaking about this and excited about this is because, I don't know how many of you have seen the YouTube, where the Anglican bishop, Bishop Tony Palmer, came to, te- to, to Texas, to a large church in Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he spoke to, to, to Protestant evangelical Christian leaders. It seemed like there was hundreds, maybe thousands of them at a big conference, and he spoke about Christian unity. And not only did he speak about Christian unity, he had a video from Pope Francis. He just met with Pope Francis. Pope Francis is his friend, and he told Pope Francis that he was going to be meeting with these these evangelical Christian leaders, and he said, you know, do you want to give them a message? And Pope Francis says, take out your phone. Let's make a video for them. And so this is on YouTube now. It's gone kind of viral. And, uh, but it's such a sign of hope. I want you to all look up that, that YouTube. All you need to write is Bishop Tony Palmer and Pope Francis. Boom, you'll get it. Anyways, seven points about Christian unity. Number one, unity among Christians must be a dream for every Christian. Every believer in Christ should long for the day that we are one again, that there is visible unity in the church. This is something that should be close to the heart of every believer in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Pope John Paul II, he said, it's a sin not to work towards unity. That's how important unity is. Second point is the work of bringing Christians together again will be a work of God. Bishop Tony Palmer talks about this. He he says that the miracle of unity has begun. And this is something as Christians that we recognize we recognize that the church has become so divided and there's so much confusion and so much division that we're kind of like Humpty Dumpty. You know how the rhyme goes. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so too the church All the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You look at the divisions among Christians, it's impossible for man. Just look, I mean, there's like over 30,000 different denominations. We disagree about all kinds of things. There's confusion, there's misinformation, all that kind of stuff. Do you think we're going to be able to put the church back together again? impossible for man. But for God, what does Scripture say? Jesus says, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And so there's been this recognition that, yes, the church will be united once again. But it's going to be a miracle. It's not going to be a work of man. It's going to be a work of God. It's going to be a miracle. And again, what Bishop uh, Tony Palmer is saying is that the miracle has begun. Point number three is that there's also been this kind of understanding, this expectation, even prophecies, that the Lord, He Himself is going to raise up prophets when He wants to work this miracle of unity. He's going to raise up prophets who are going to speak boldly and with the anointing of the Spirit saying that the the disunity in the church must end. It's a scandal. It's an embarrassment. It's a shame. People who will speak with the authority of God, with the anointing of the Spirit, they will have the leaders realize that we must work for unity. 
We need to get off our high horses. We need to kind of get out of our, our you know, indifference. And we must work for unity. It's so important. And the Lord, He will raise up prophets who will insist on this, who will have the authority of God, the anointing of the Spirit, and will say, now is the time. The disunity must end. We must unite, and we must unite now. You know, you look at, um, in, in the Middle East and other parts of the world, these demonstrations. People are demanding democracy. They're, they're demanding freedom. And they're using the social media. And oftentimes, it's the younger people who have this, this hope, this, this idealism. And they're saying, we want freedom, and we want it now. And so, too, the Lord will raise up prophets who will say, now is the time for unity. We must work towards this. The fourth point is, the unity we're talking about is what we call visible unity. The truth is, is that the body of Christ, the church, theologically, as Bishop Tony says, is one. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter what denominations and all that, we are sons and daughters of the same Father. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. But there are these divisions. Another saying is, the walls that divide us do not reach to heaven. There's walls that divide us, but they don't reach to heaven. But those walls must come down because they're a scandal and they're an embarrassment and they also prevent the proclamation of the gospel. And so again, the unity we're talking about is a visible unity where we can, where we can speak about our differences, where we can speak about our differences in an intelligent way. And that's what Bishop Tony Palmer is offering. It's very easy to get together with, you know, different Christian denominations, sing and praise together, give each other a hug and say, that was wonderful. But there are still things that divide us that at one point we need to talk about those things. We need to talk about those things in a respectful and an intelligent way if we want to move forward. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Point number five, in order for this unity to happen, and again, this is, everyone has been speaking about this, there must be a humbling. We must humble ourselves. We have to get over our anger, our hurts, our insecurities, and whatever else. All of us as Catholics, we've been hurt by non-Catholics. You know, trying to take good Catholics away from their Catholicism, saying things that are not true, you know, things like that. We've all been hurt. We need to forgive and we need to rise above that. We need to humble ourselves, rise above that, and, 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 and have, have a, a love for our brothers and sisters, even if they don't reciprocate that love. And when we find non-Catholics who have that love, you know, we need to, to get together with them. That, that is a must. We must love and respect one another. We need to see ourselves as not us versus them, them but as journeying together towards unity. All of us we're still learning. You know, we're, we're still deepening our faith. When I was a young Catholic, I had these views that were more Catholic or that were, you know, more Catholic than the Pope. And then I went to seminary and I saw so many of the things we argue about between Catholics and Protestants, they're not issues. If you really go into the theology, you talk to the Catholic theologians, the Protestant theologians, we agree. No issue. And yet, at a lower level, we'll fight about these things and argue and quote scriptures and we're wasting our time. A lot more unites us than divides us. We need to humble ourselves and have a love, a respect for each other. Point number six, the reason this is so important, the reason they say this is in some ways even more important than evangelization 
is because, as it says in John 17, that Jesus' dying prayer was, Father, may they be one so that the world may believe. And the understanding is the world will not believe until we are one. And that's why we can have, and we've seen this, we've seen great evangelistic efforts in different parts of the world and trying to, you know, save the lost and all that type of thing. And oftentimes, in the long run, there's not that lasting conversion and fruit and growth. And a lot of people are saying it's because we're not united. If we, were, if we were going forward united, if people could say, look at how they love one another, the work of evangelization would move forward so much quicker. Not only the work of evangelization, but all the other works. The works of justice. The works of protecting our environment. The works of, of feeding the poor. The works of caring for the sick. The works of educating people who can, don't have access to education. As Christians, we could do so much more if we were united. Our disunity is preventing that. And then finally, point number seven, and again, Bishop Tony Palmer talks about this, is kind of the, the glue or the fire or the, the, the power to this unity is the glory of God. It's the Spirit of God. And when we experience that together, we quickly see that, yes, we are one. You know, have you ever been to, a, you know, a, a gathering where um, a, a non-Catholic Christian speaks and shares the faith? And you can tell that this speaker has a great love for God, but also a great love for Catholics and a respect for Catholics. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience when we worship together. And the flip side is, is myself, you know, as a, as a Catholic priest, you know, I've been sometimes privileged to speak in, in, in settings that were uh, not Catholic, just, you know, just non-Catholic Christians, and I love, I love our Protestant brothers and sisters. I love our Pentecostals. I love our Evangelicals. I don't judge them. I see ourselves as one. I know we're all a work in progress and there are things we have to sort out, but I love them. And when I get an opportunity to pe preach to the Pentecostals, oh, I love it. And when I get an opportunity to preach to the Evangelicals, I love it. And I let her rip. I preach in a, you know, just in a loving, joyful, non-judgmental way. And guess what? They love it. They're saying, he's one of us. He gets it. He has the glory. Maybe we are one after all. And brothers and sisters, again, that's the glue. That's the power. That's the key. If we want the unity, we need to experience the glory together. And again, it's not just a Catholic speaking to the Protestants, but man, I've heard Protestants speaking to Catholics, and you can tell they love us. They don't judge us. They're thrilled about us, and they want to pour out the love of God, you know, to us. And boy, that's awesome, awesome, awesome. That's the key. That's what we must experience. And when we all experience that, or when more of us experience that, then the path to unity is clear. Then the other things that need to be sorted out that will be sorted out with much more ease and simplicity. Can you imagine if in our generation the church could become one again? Wouldn't that be awesome? That's what we're praying for and that's what we're hoping for. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous episodes 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube. Just visit our website foodforlifetvministry.org and click on Watch Now on YouTube. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at eternal salvation. I wish a priest from the pulpit would have lovingly warned me that my eternal salvation was at stake with the decisions I was making. I never heard that strong message. It would have been a hard message to hear, but I wish I would have heard it at the right time.
So if you're my vintage, or maybe a little bit older, you'll remember a program called Mission Impossible. And the show would always start off the same, where the agent would receive, um, would receive a tape, right? and uh, would listen to the tape that would describe the mission that this agent was to fulfill. And at the end of the tape, it was always the same kind of question, you know, if you decide to accept this mission. Well, God, God has a mission for you. Did you know that? That he has a mission for you that's perhaps different than the mission that I have. But we all share a common mission. The church has consistently taught that it actually exists to evangelize, that the mission of the church is to evangelize. And the church didn't make this up. The church got this from the words of Jesus himself who said, go into the whole world and make disciples of all nations. So that's, that's actually our job. The job of the church is to evangelize. And because we as the, as the laity, those who aren't ordained and those who haven't embraced the consecrated single life, because we are 99.9% .9 of the church, that mission of evangelization falls on you and falls on me. Now that's kind of a negative definition, right? The positive definition is that we have access to people that our parish priest doesn't. Our parish priest has access to, to those that, that fill the pews. And that's not to say that people who are in the pews need to be evangelized. Hey, I need to be evangelized. My, my conversion is still in progress. But especially today, most of the people that need to hear the gospel won't be found in a pew. They're going to be found at Home Depot, and they're going to be found at Walmart. They're going to be found at your, at your doctor's office. They're going to be found at the water cooler. And so who is going to share the gospel with them? Well, it's in God's heart that it's you and it's me. It's almost like this. It's almost like God has split up the world in, into territories, into regions, right? And those regions, those territories that God has assigned correspond to our lives. <laughs> Jesus was sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Chris. <laughs> it's, almost like, it's almost like I have my own parish <laughs> outside of the four walls of the church, and I call it St. Chris. Well, not a saint yet, but... God willing in the future, and God is willing. So we all have a territory. We all have a mission field. And that mission field is our lives. There was, um, there was a sign I saw in my neighborhood, uh, a sign from a, a real estate agent that says, love where you live. And this is probably the most successful real estate agent in my neighborhood. And what a great sign for a real estate agent. Love where you live. Yes, you know, if you, if you go with me, you know, I'll help you find a house that, that you're going to love. But one day, when I drove by, something inside of me had a different spin on this. Love where, you're li where you live. That evangelization is basically the call to love. To, to pour out our lives. To serve. And one of the ways we do that is we do explicitly share the gospel. But we're meant to be the light of God and the love of God. And where are we to love? Where we live. And so that's, that's where we evangelize. So you have a mission. Did you know that you're a missionary and that you have an assignment from God? I think a lot about evangelization and, and how it works. It's one of my pet topics. And one of the best ways, I think, to characterize how we're evangelists is the notion of ambassador. It's actually um, a metaphor that St. Paul uses. He says, you know, we are ambassadors. It's as if God was making his appeal through us. And I really like that metaphor because it's, it, speaks to, um, it speaks to the notion of assignment. An ambassador is assigned to a location, right? 
And in that assignment, he or she gently, kindly, diplomatically, but unwaveringly represents where they're from. Because the ambassador isn't from here. And neither are we. In a certain sense, as St. Paul would say, we're aliens, we're not from here, that heaven is our final destiny. And so in our lives, where we've been assigned as an ambassador, we represent the kingdom of God with all love and with all humility. Because our dignity as ambassadors doesn't come from us, it comes from who we represent. And so we can be perfectly humble as we represent the kingdom of God where we are. To echo the, the famous words, as far as I'm concerned, of Father Bob Bedard, who said, you know, my faith and my spiritual life has not made me better than anyone else, but it certainly made me better than I was. And so as ambassadors with this great gentleness, kindness, diplomacy, and yet clarity, we represent the kingdom of God where we live. And so you're an ambassador and so am I. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, this wonderful and most dignified calling we have to represent you and represent the kingdom of God for the kingdom of God is, is even in us. Father, we're, we really do fumble around. Like we really have a lot to learn about what it means to share the gospel in a way that is, is loving and is clear. We're not always great witnesses. So Father, we ask you to help us and give us your wisdom. Help us to do everything we do with love and help us to do it where we live. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous editions 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube. Just visit our website, foodforlifetvministry.org and click on Watch Now on YouTube. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask you make your check payable to Food for Life. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at eternal salvation. I wish a priest from the pulpit would have lovingly warned me that my eternal salvation was at stake with the decisions I was making. I never heard that strong message. It would have been a hard message to hear, but I wish I would have heard it at the right time. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.